Take a network break. Help yourself to a virtual donut as we talk through this week's tech news. We've got a new firewall from Fortinet, a funding round for Netbox, phantom juice jacking attacks, tech execs being held responsible for tech mishaps, and more IT news and commentary. We're sponsored today by Nokia and its data center fabric for network automation and orchestration. Nokia's data center fabric is designed for day zero design, day one deployment, and operations for day two and beyond. Find out more at nokia.ly slash dc dash fabric and listen to heavy networking episode 653 to get details and hear customer use cases. Um, we're happy to announce that uh, we're launching a brand new podcast this May. It's Heavy Wireless with Keith Parsons. The official launch date is May 2nd. Very exciting. Keith Parsons is a well-known person in the wireless industry. Uh, obviously, has uh, been doing a lot of training for a lot of different companies over the years. And he is the host, I think it's the Wireless Land Professionals Conference, the WLPC conference. He's actually the person who runs that event. Um, and he's decided that he wanted to do a podcast and to bring it onto the Packet Pushers Network. So if you're into wireless, you need to subscribe. Like Heavy Strategy, it's not part of the fat pipe or the aggregated feed, so you need to subscribe to it separately. Please do that. Also subscribe to Heavy Strategy as well, of course. But, yes, this is going to be very exciting. Keith, of course, has like 30-plus years' experience in the industry, has been podcasting for a long time, uh, we've seen the plans for it, and he's already got like six shows done, I think, or something like that. But like at least really six excited. shows lined up, yeah. And he's got mm. a long roster of folks in the know about the the wireless space. So we're anticipating mm. fantastic guests, really nerdy, deep conversations. Yep. So do a search for Heavy Wireless in your podcatcher and subscribe. And it's also on our website as well. Yeah, packetpushers.net slash series slash heavy dash wireless. You can go find out. And if you want to subscribe, uh, that would be great. And first episode will launch on May 2nd. So hope to see you there. All right, let's get into the news. Fortinet has launched a new firewall. It's the FortiGate 7081.f. It's a big beast. It can support up to 16 400 gig ports, 3600 gig ports, and 80 25 or 10 gig ports. Max firewall throughput is 330 gigabits per second, and IPS throughput of 405 gigabits per second. It supports IPsec and SSL VPNs and can handle up to 600 million concurrent TCP sessions. It's a big box. This, <laughs> who said heavy metal is dead, right? It's a. It's quite a big box. The two chassis-based firewalls, fundamentally, they have two line cards that go in the middle. Those are where the Ethernet ports sit. And then you drop in processing cards that then scale out the performance as best as I can tell. I do hope I've got that right. I haven't got into the architectural stuff of the overall thing. So you have interface modules, which give you the basic functionality. And then you have processor modules, which allow you to do a bunch of fabric channels. And even though it's a firewall, it also supports the Fortinet stacking protocol, so virtual chassis, and it'll handle up to 300 switches in a stack. So not only will it, is it sort of built for a campus-style environment, you know, where you're doing like hundreds of gigabits per second of throughput, but it's also able to do virtual stacking, so virtual chassis. So if you have a campus network with up to 300 switches, it could be the central control point for just one, you know, the whole thing becomes a virtual chassis out of this big, big thing. Right. Some of the numbers were just surprising. I I was sort of always thought that we didn't need this, but then I keep forgetting about campus. <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> it's still there. Yeah, it didn't go away. Um, but the box is huge. And, of course, hard at Fortinet has the Essex. They talk, still talk about their security processes and network processes, content processes in this case. Uh, it can do some really uh, high-speed numbers. Uh, let me give you a sense of what some of them are. So IPv4 firewall throughput at uh, 64 byte sizes, half a terabit. But if you're sending through, say, 512 byte average size, you're talking about 1.1 terabit per second of uh -huh. gross throughput. Uh, the throughput drops away as you do deeper and deeper inspection. Of course, you get into an IPsec VPN. It does 378 gigabits per second. Uh, Fortinet has a good stab at trying to show you that the performance drops off as you implement more and more of the advanced features. And I think generally they try to give you a good sense. Not all vendors do this. A lot of vendors try and hide the fact that, oh, it's a terabit firewall. But, you know, when you're doing SSL, it's only 13 gigabits per second, SSL VPNs, you know. Right. So you've got to be just a little bit careful when you do this. Now, SSL VPN at 13 gigabits is a lot. There's not too many companies out there with 100 gig pipes into their companies needing, you know, 10 more than 10 gigabits per second of SSL VPN. But... You know, interesting to see this hardware still shipping. Fortinet is one of the few making the bigger and bigger firewalls today. And most of the other companies have sort of abandoned that part of the market and gone off to, you know, 
work in somebody else's cloud or something. Yeah, and making their own ASICs as well. That's uh, what, mm. what they would consider one of their key value propositions or differentiators. And as we mentioned, it has a network processor ASIC and a content processor ASIC that are offloading different functions to get the uh, performance they're talking about. And I do think they do, when they talk about performance, talk about it with multiple features activated, but as, as always, you want to double check that for yourself. Yeah, and it's big. This thing is like 10 <laughs> slots long. I mean, the one I I'm looking at, the, at is 10 at the, slots. You know. The energy consumption, it's over 6,000 watts. So yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a Which lot isn't of too bad for a 10-slot chassis, right? Um, yeah. If you're loading out all the modules and running them, that's, it's, I mean, it's not great, but it's, it is what it is. Right, if you need it, you need it. So. You need it, that's right. All right, links in the show notes. If you want to read up on it, we'll move on. At Netbox Labs, they've raised $20 million in a Series A round to drive the growth of Netbox. Netbox is an open source software that stores details about network equipment, including things like IP addresses, VRFs, AS numbers, VLANs, cabling, and more. It's essentially designed to underpin network automation efforts by serving as a source of truth or system of record for network resources. Yeah, I think this is really exciting. Netbox has had a bit of a varied history over the last five years as an open source project. It's sort of wandered around and then it had a bit of a dark period of what I think about five years ago when someone forked the project to commercialize it because the Netbox team wanted to stay and then NetS1 picked them up for a while and sort of sponsored them, I guess would be the way by employing Jeremy. But now it would seem that they've been able to get completely separate funding so that the capabilities behind Netbox, which is very popular as a tool, by the way, because it's fundamentally a, an IPEM and a DSIM, mm -hmm. you know, data center manager and a IP address DNS manager and be interesting to see how they can grow from here and maintain the product and grow the product. But 20 million, it sounds like a lot of funding. So hopefully they've got a plan to, you know, turn that into a revenue stream as well. Yeah, my understanding is that um, it was originally developed at DigitalOcean by uh, a guy named Jeremy Stretch. Uh, it was brought into NS1, uh, which is a DDI provider. Then NS1 was uh, launched a commercial version, a SaaS version of Netbox. And then when NS1 got acquired by IBM, uh, some folks decided uh, to spin out Netbox and Netbox Labs as a standalone company. So they're still keeping it open source and still offering a commercial SaaS version. And that's the, the growth plan. I think they want to support the community, but also have a path to profitability. I think that makes sense. Netbox is kind of a de facto, especially if you're um, doing artisanal automation with Python and Ansible, it becomes the the source of truth and you tend to use the APIs. But Netbox has also been a good citizen in the sense that uh, it's been willing to interoperate left and right and, you know, work in with other products and right. it's been somewhat in demand. So I think it's it's very useful in terms of defining a standard set of functionality for a lot of people and for a lot of mid-sized companies, it will be a very valuable tool, you know, if you want to do that. For me, I'm still believe that most people would be better off with a vendor package that does more. That's not to say that's the only way. I'm just saying I think generally for most people it would be better in that direction. Uh, you know, you're, if you're going to go with SDN or some, some sort of manager, you might be better looking at a commercial product that embraces it all, gives you support and does a lot more work for you. Maybe, maybe not. All right, we'll move on. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of stories about IT consequences. Uh, first, the former CIO of a British bank has been fined 81,000 pounds by UK regulators for IT problems that locked millions of bank customers out of their accounts back in 2018. This is according to The Guardian. And then second, the register reporting that executives and managers at Chinese tech giant Tencent have been demoted and fired after a multi-hour outage shut down the popular platforms WeChat and QQ. Uh, Greg, you're saying, I think your point here is that, oh, we're actually seeing some executives take have to take responsibility for <laughs> IT issues. Well, I've been pretty vocal about that uh, over on Heavy Strategy and, of course, here and, and on other shows that there are no consequences for failure in enterprise IT. Like if a vendor produces a product that's just faulty, you know, customer gets stiffed and on we go, right? Uh, and if you're working in an IT team and somebody does something that's a horrible decision, it's like, well, so what? They're not going to get fired or sacked. They're probably going to get rewarded and they're probably going to walk out the door and go on to another job at another company and do the same stupid thing again. So it's interesting here that sort of like uh, the British government has, you know, the, the regulators here have personally fined this individual as the executive of the company. 81,000 pounds is not a whole lot of money. That's kind of 120,000 US. But it's more the stigma of, you know, this man, this person will have a reputation as somebody who failed to conduct an outsourcing agreement uh, correctly and failed to, you know, as as the CTO of one of the top five banks in the country, the TSB Bank was oh, and is a large bank in the UK. And the outage was horrendous. Like it just went down. Millions of people were locked out, some for months afterwards and unable to access any of their funds. And the bank 
refused to pay out money because it didn't know how much money you had and all this sort of stuff. But in this case, the government has assigned personal blame to this executive. And the suggestion is that there may be more executives pursued. So we could actually see the CEO and, you know, people on the board pursued over this for failing to implement an IT strategy. Because when you get to be a bank at that level, you're actually a critical infrastructure as part of society. And if you fail to deliver, you're responsible. And it's good to see that happening over IT just as much as it would be, you know, if there's a run on the bank or, you know, something else. Right on the finance side, if they were mismanaging their their finances, yeah. Yeah, or personal, you know, like, you know, sexual abuse or, you know, whatever it is, yeah. Well, I mean, on one hand, yes, the fine, I guess, is, you know, a a signal that there may be... uh, tech executives may be held responsible for tech problems, but it didn't really seem to harm this particular CIO's career. He kept his position at the bank for another year after the outage uh, and then left to become the CIO of the bank's parent company. And he was that he held that position, I guess, until recently. He just stepped down in 2023. So hmm. kind of a mixed message. Like, is this well, an I issue mean, or do you fail it, right? up? Uh, he got he away got with away. it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the point is whenever you're an IT executive, you just keep failing upwards, you know? or as I call it, seagulls, come in, dump a lot of crap everywhere and then fly off to the next one, right? That's what most IT executives do. And this guy was doing that, I think, deliberately or not, and somehow the system caught up with him. In China, I think the difference, of course, there is that we haven't seen too many people fired for failures, but these were reasonably brief outages and it says that some people were demoted and some people were fired. Mm -hmm. I think the article tries to suggest that they were both, but I don't think that's actually actually viable. I don't think, unless there's some sort of like, we're going to take away your severance salary by demoting you and then firing you or something, Mm -hmm. which would be uh, harsh, I guess. Yeah. My read was that some executives got demoted or got demerits in their records. And then it was some uh, lower level managers who were actually fired in the, in the 10 cent case. And yes, it was just a brief outage, uh, Mm -hmm. but platforms like WeChat in China are used for lots besides social media. It's like payment systems and so on. So Mm -hmm. I guess it can have an impact for it to go down for a bit. It's interesting, if this sort of trend continues, you consider things like AWS with their US East, which goes out all the time, Mm -hmm. because it's one of their first data centers, and it's notoriously sort of had a reputation for going down because it's the oldest and least capable of their data centers, perhaps. Um, Azure goes out on a regular basis, Google Cloud, you know, uh, Oracle Cloud. If they go out, are they culpable? Well, they would say that they're not responsible. That's all your fault. Uh, But at some point, when it gets negligent enough or impactful enough, maybe not. I think one of the reasons why tech executives have escaped blame so far is because their IT is so complex and there are so many interdependencies that it's mm. probably fairly simple to, to take some blame and, and shift it elsewhere and sort of obfuscate mm. and so on. Uh, on the other hand, at least here in the US, executives are paid ludicrous salaries. Uh, and I mm. guess if you're being paid a ludicrous salary, maybe you should also bear a proportionate amount of responsibility. So. Well, you should take responsibility for, the lu- lu- you know, for being ludicrously wealthy, right? With big risks, big gains come big risks. That's, It'll be interesting yes. to see if we can put pin more on vendors for faulty products. That's I think the one that's I really want to see. Really, what needs to happen? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I but in this case, there was a definite link between the outsourcing contract and the outsourcing contract was mismanaged after sending it over. I get the sense that I don't know. Just reading between the lines, I can imagine like, oh, we outsourced it. You know, dusting hands off. <laughs> <laughs> it's their problem now, not yeah, my that's problem. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yes, no, but, no, we're definitely fixing it. Yeah, we know. No, we'll have an answer for you by close of business t- t- today. Yeah, it's like, mm, anyway. All right. Uh, in a letter to shareholders, Amazon CEO Andy Jassy is outlining the risks and opportunities for AWS. He's citing short-term headwinds because companies are more cautious about spending. But he also notes that almost 90% of IT spending is still on-premises, which I think is a significant nod to opportunities for AWS to capture more of that spending. I think there's a couple of things here. Um the audience for this newsletter is, of course, not customers or analysts, it's shareholders. So um, you tend to get a different take on things when CEOs of companies talk to shareholders, and the angle will be very different from what you might see at an AWS reInvent, of course, right? So keep that in mind here. I think the angle that Andy Jassy's taking is that AWS's growth is slowing. It's not shrinking. Instead of getting 40% growth in the cloud, say an AWS business unit or the 25% growth in Amazon the, as the supermarket type thing, that growth is slowing as sales slow, people return to pre-COVID behaviors sort of globally. It, different companies, countries have different responses and there's a lot of slowdown, right? And they're saying to cus- I think what he's trying to say to, to shareholders is AWS is not growing because customers are cutting back. And of course, when you're in the cloud, 
you've got the option to cut back. And there's a lot of venture capitalists who rely on AWS, a lot of startups, a lot of small projects that get used in AWS. And if they feel like saving money is more important than spending money, that means they're not only adding more, they're actively turning around and applying resources to cutting and simplifying and improving or make it, finding efficiencies inside. And so AWS's revenue is down, is slowing, and so is Amazon's more thing. But Andy Jesse was at pains to say, but don't worry, we're going to keep spending big money building the next generation of AWS, building the next generation of Amazon in the markets, and especially around the ad campaign, and be ready for when the boom comes around again. So this is this sort of boosterism that we see from technology companies that the next boom is just a couple of years away. So we never stop spending. We just keep spending until we get to it, right? right. And so if you're a shareholder, no profits. We're just going to keep spending big, right? So does that make sense? It does, yep. Yep. So I, I didn't get the sense that he was an all apologetic about the fact that he's not going to hit his forecasts or any of that sort of stuff. Well, I uh, actually, in reading the section on AWS, I felt like he was acknowledging that customers are getting worried about how much AWS and other cloud services are costing them. He does mm. note in the letter that, of course, the cloud is elastic, meaning you can scale back capacity that you aren't using. But mm -hmm. like cost and capacity optimization, that's that's really harder than it sounds uh, for most IT organizations. And so in a way, it feels like he's blaming his customers like, well, maybe you should be a little more careful with the resources you're using as opposed to being like, yeah, we're expensive and we're, we're sucking money out of you. And that's yeah, that's why, right. That's why this I is slowing of, down. I definitely have the sense from the, the people, the forums I'm reading and the posts I'm reading that customers are realizing that the cloud, off-prem cloud is very expensive, like, you know, way more expensive than they could possibly have imagined. And there's a real concern that they need to cut that back. And they're literally diverting features. Instead of developing new features and iterating the product, they're now turning resources around to cost control and efficiencies and, and looking at, you know, spending a lot of time developing code to be more efficient and so forth. And that includes a lot of people actually beginning to move back to on-prem, right? Even though he says it's not. There was a, an interesting number in there uh, let me give you the quote here. And he says, this is Andy Jassy. He says, and it's a similar story for global IT spending where we have AWS revenue of 80 billion in 2022 with about 90% of global IT spending still on premises and yet to migrate to the cloud. So remember how I've been saying that the off-prem cloud is still very small and very emergent. Here he's saying that AWS is only 10% of global IT spending. That is not what most people there's a, that is the screaming sound that you hear of analysts around the world who've been telling everybody 30, 40% of enterprise IT spending is now in the cloud. It's not. It's 10%. And that comes directly from Andy Jesse. What do you think about that? <laughs> well, we know there's a lot of hype around cloud, so I'm not yeah. surprised that there's a difference, a difference in numbers, yeah. Uh, and it does, I think it's a good reminder that even though a lot of the focus is on cloud, that the on-prem side still sucks up most of your IT spending. Exactly, right? And I think there's going to be a lot of very embarrassed analysts out there this week trying to justify why it's not, you know, they've been telling customers, telling me 30 to 40% of spending is going, is already in the cloud. It's not, it's, it's a tiny, tiny fraction. Um, and if you consider that AWS has spent what, 300, 400 billion to build out a business with to get that 80 billion in revenue, that is, that's not profit by the way, that's zero profit. So what they've done is, you know, if you value that business at, you know, five times, revenue, which is not unreasonable because it's a high cost, high operating cost, very niche business, but still got value. They've probably spent $400 billion to get a $400 billion business. That's not a huge amount of growth, although you do own a $400 billion business, right? <laughs> so... Well, I mean, that's basically Amazon's strategy from the very beginning. They always spent more than they made because they wanted to drive competitors out of the market and I think and be the first to market. And I think in some respects, Amazon has done very well. I think Azure's caught up pretty well, but Amazon is still, I think, the biggest player in cloud and will continue to invest in all sorts of ways, uh, adding new services, new features. They're developing their own hardware, their own chips and so on. Uh, they're going to be moving into AI very, very quickly. So I, that seems very much in line with the whole Amazon business model and shareholders should know that, that Amazon is all about capturing market at any cost. If I'm a customer of AWS and their growth continues to slow down, they're going to run out of money to be able to do a lot of fancy projects like building transformers and space gateways. And, um, you know, they've got funding for projects like custom ASICs, like Gravitron and Inferentia and training, you know, where they build uh, custom ASICs for the networking, for AI inference, 
ML inference and training for AI training, right? Mm-hmm. And those are, you know, 200, 300, 400 million dollar efforts per year to get those chips designed and then manufactured. If AWS is, starts to run out of money, like if the business starts to actually stabilize into a flat line, then that's going to change the game for them. And what does that mean? Do they then start to turn back to commodity? Do they start to turn to somebody like Intel or, you know, ARM to make those chips for them because they can't buy them in sufficient volume or whatever? So long as the market's changing, a, AWS has got something to go on, right? They've got a, if I spend money on this, there's a new thing to go with this. If we get to a point of where the market reaches a stasis, I think everything changes for the off-prem cloud because all of a sudden it becomes commodity and the on-prem stuff can catch up and then it becomes a very different game. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out in the years ahead. I guess, but I think the sudden emergence of AI uh, and its integration with business services is now the great new frontier and the great new hype cycle, and AWS is all in on that, uh, mm-hmm. and that is going to give them an opportunity to, again, lure customers in early with lots of promises about what they'll be able to deliver. And frankly, if there was a slowdown in AWS, I don't know the customers would mind. AWS rolls out so many new services and uh, capabilities. I think Andy Jassy mentioned something like 2,000 uh, in, in just the last year that, like, customer that's more than any customer can digest. So like if they do mm. slow down a little bit, I don't I don't see that as a problem. No, but it could be long term. Right. Their the whole business is focused around growth, not profitability. And if it suddenly turns around that there's no more growth for whatever reason, the market's saturated or sure. you know, get, there's some sort of stasis point reached, does their business model survive? That right. is it's highly and, likely that they will, but you know, that is a question. Right. And Building data centers is expensive and there are hard limits on how many you can build based on space and power and so on. So, yeah. Yeah. Are, well, there's no more limits. power available in the US. I mean, I guess you could build Europe, the data center yeah. on the moon and then mm-hmm. connect it to your space network. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, the data centers there. that they're building now, they have to build their own power generation. Mm-hmm. They're not willing to sign up for 30 to 50 year contracts to build a power station that's going to generate, you know, 30,000 megawatts. They want 50 megawatts or 100 megawatts for a data center. So they now have to build subscale power generation, you know solar power, gas, you know, whatever it might be. With Maybe that's a whole new market for Amazon. They'll get into the electricity That's business. right. You know, th- but the power that they're building is sub- subscale. It's not a power station. It's not an atomic power plant. It's not a, you know, whatever. So it'll be interesting to see how the game changes because they've been, up until now, data centers have been just a, a percentage point or two of the total power generation and distribution. But increasingly, there's none left. Nobody wants to sell them power because they want cheap power They're very aggressive and they want to put SLAs on and the power companies are going like, no, I'll sell it to retail market. It's more profitable there. Why would I, I sell it to you know? I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised that there's a few of those you know two or three page memos floating around Amazon talking mm. about electricity as a service and Amazon nuclear divisions. Uh, <laughs> I would no doubt that they would have looked at that and done some analysis, but whether it got very far, hmm, uh, stay tuned. Oh, maybe I'm not. gonna I'm gonna put that on the prediction sheet. I'm, right. I'm, I'm, I'm calling it. <laughs> All right, <laughs> go for it. Yeah. Uh, Links in the show notes if you want to go read uh, Andy Jassy's comments to shareholders for yourself. We're going to take a quick break to tell you about our sponsor, Nokia. We're sponsored by Nokia and its data center fabric for network automation and orchestration. Nokia's data center fabric is designed for automation from day zero to day one deployment and operations for day two and beyond. The scalable fabric helps network teams keep pace with demand for new applications and services, reduce risks with digital sandbox to test changes against your actual network configuration, and provides insights into visibility and performance with deep telemetry. The fabric comes together with Nokia's SR Linux Network OS, the intent-based fabric services system platform, a digital sandbox, the NetOps development kit or NDK, and more. You can get all these details at nokia.ly slash dc-fabric and listen to heavy networking episode 653 to learn about how it all works and how customers are using Nokia's data center fabric in production. So go to nokia.ly slash dc-fabric and listen to heavy networking episode 653. We thank Nokia for being a sponsor. Okay, there was a recent flurry of news stories about the risks of juice jacking in which uh, malicious actors are compromising public USB charging stations to load malware onto mobile devices while people recharge. Uh, In the United States, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, and the FBI both released public warnings. Uh, But uh, Greg, you dug up uh, a a link, I guess, from journalist Dan Gooden saying that the risks may be overblown. (laughs) This is an odd story. Like, if the FCC and the FBI release a public notice claiming that juice jacking is a problem. That's where you plug your smartphone into a USB charge point at an airport or a coffee shop, right? Mm -hmm. And it's always possible that somebody can install something in that that actually then installs malware onto your phone. We've known this for quite some time, but there hasn't been a lot of evidence 
to actually say that it's happening. Like, yes, it does happen, but it tends to be highly targeted industrial espionage or, you know, military, senior military officers or mm-hmm. or government officials and so forth. So it's not really been. So to see this sort of released from the US government as a public thing, and then Dan Gooden pipes up and says, uh, I actually tried to dig into this, and he said apparently it seems that there was a Los Angeles district attorney's warning uh, published 18 months ago, which was later depublished, <laughs> and then the FCC said they received some information from a 2019 New York Times article uh, having received consumer complaints, but the FBI person says, well, we came from from that after talking to the FCC who quoted that, who quoted the previous. So there's actually maybe there's nothing behind this at all. So, it does seem like, you know, some somebody attached uh, to some other quote that, that somebody else picked up and based it on the original quote, which wasn't really that big of an issue and it sort of spun out of control. I know. What he, I mean, the thing is, that generally, if the FBI says something, I want them to be a trusted source. Like if GCHQ in the UK <laughs> says something or that, you know, <laughs> I want them to be, a, that's like the ultimate. If they say something, they don't just, but no, apparently you can have a junior officer at a field office making an announcement based on, you know, that seems about right. And that's a concern. That is a real concern. So. And the media loves these kind of stories and they are quick to pick them up and promote them. Uh, so, yeah, yeah it, it does. Bike shedding. I, it's it's bike shedding. Everybody understands juice checking. You know, this idea of plugging a USB into something and then it just takes over your phone is like something out of a Hollywood movie, right? Oh, exactly. Yes, you could imagine the, the, the scenes, yes. Mm. Uh, I will say I read the FCC warning, and uh, whether it's accurate or not, it does, I think, offer reasonable tips for some basic security hygiene suggestions like just plug into an AC outlet instead of directly into a USB charger, and don't use USB cables that have been left behind at a charging station, which I, I do think is good advice, whether or not oh, yeah. juice jacking is you a can significant buy, um, risk. You can buy USB cables that will hijack phones and computers and stuff off the shelf now. Sure. Just the yeah. cable, yeah. You, it doesn't have to be a whole you know, USB port in a wall with a special piece of, a, it's just the cable. Yeah. Right. So the, the potential is real. Whether it's a significant risk, eh, seems uh, like. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But, but again, don't plug things into strange cables that have been left behind just as a general, as a general <laughs> rule. Are power cable, are USB charge cables or not charge cables, but USB cables becoming the uh, USB. The USB drives, stick. Yes. USB <laughs> stick of the past. I know. That's right. It could be. You heard it here first, folks. Yeah, that's, right. <laughs> so that's our that's our PSA, our public service yeah. announcement for for the episode. Yeah, that's right. All right. Uh, global PC shipments have dropped by almost a third in the first quarter of 2023. That's according to two analyst firms. Apparently, Apple was the biggest loser with 40 percent drop, followed by Dell at 31 percent, Lenovo. Asus Tech and HP also saw declines. Uh, analysts are citing soft demand, too much inventory, and the ongoing specter of dour economic forecasts. Yeah, so the logical extension here is that uh, during COVID, everybody bought laptops and they're not standing back up for a repeat. So probably most laptops out there are, what, two years old, do you think, Drew? 21, 2021? Yeah, 2020, 2021. Yeah, two to three years old. Uh Two to three years old, so maybe not up for a refresh. And Apple in particular, where I would say that for most people, an Apple computer would last four or five years for most people, not two to three years that most Windows do, uh, laptops do. Anyway, the numbers are across the board, 30% down. Uh, and this is not only uh, IDC saying this, this is also Canalyst, which is also another market researcher who does numbers analysis. And uh, the reason that I put this out is that uh, Apple has been in the head, is the headline here. Apple sales drops 45% <laughs> in Mac it's, and in the, uh, in the shares. If you go onto the, the sites that talk about Apple's share price, they're all having a flap about it how bad it's going to be for Apple, but I don't think it's, it is. I think it was pretty much predicted. And it was rather obvious between the inflation problems that we've had, the bank collapses, uh, the uncertainty around business, you know, the windbacks that we've been seeing over the last year, as well as the post-COVID bounce, all entirely predictable. Right. And I'm sure Apple doesn't like to see sales drop, but they are sitting on so much money, they probably wouldn't have to sell anything for the next 10 years and they'd still be fine. Well, if they sit on too much inventory, the challenge here is that if they've built all those laptops thinking that there might be more, which I don't find likely, um, then, you know, or if they've bought parts for forward ordered parts, then they could push back new models until the inventory has been sold down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. So we yeah. might see a slowdown in innovation is the risk there. I guess. Yeah. It seems like a tempest in a teapot to me, but. It's also bad for Intel, of course. 
Speaking of Intel. Speak of, oh, nice lead in. Well done. Yeah, see that? Just hey, that. The hey. slick. Uh, <laughs> Intel's foundry division has entered an agreement with ARM to manufacture low power system on chip processors. The partnership's going to focus on mobile chipsets, but an Intel press release cites the potential to expand to IoT, automotive, data center, and other sectors. Now, there's a part about the, you know, snowball and hell type thing going on here. Uh, whereas Intel's now planning to make ARM CPUs, which, of course, <laughs> just a few years ago would not have been even uh, considered. Right. Uh, but I think the important part here is to consider that Intel really is now two businesses. One is the designing and marketing of chips. Its own, for, for example, it's CPUs, it's GPUs, it's various acceleration chips, it's NICs. It's got chips around NICs and various technologies and so forth. Uh, and then it has a manufacturing business. And that's called Intel's Foundry Services, and it is IFS, which has partnered with ARM today to announce a multi-generation agreement to enable chip designers to build low-power socks on the Intel 18 Angstrom process. Now, 18 Angstrom is a 1.8 nanometers, and so if you're thinking about the leading edge in 2023 being 3 nanometers, which is what TSMC is doing, uh, Intel is now moving into a design process, which is the next generation after three nanometers. So this isn't this year, probably not next year. My sense is 2025. It didn't say in the press release though. So nanometers I'm comfortable with, Angstrom's, does this, is this another nomenclature I have to learn? No, well, after nano is Ang. Ah, uh, okay. So right, so when you go to nanometers, they're, they're then after anticipating nanometers, the curve. Okay. Angstrom's. Yeah, sort Got of. It. That's That's concept enough. So three nanometers... 1.8 angstroms is 1.8 nanometers or 2 nanometers or whatever you want to call it, right? So it's mm -hmm. the, and because the process is so small, less power, less heating and so forth. So the challenge here for Intel is that its foundry processes and its foundry equipment is radically different to how TSMC and Samsung work. Mm -hmm. So you actually have to totally redesign the chip at a physical level. The logics of the CPU architecture is in place. ARM has defined all of the code and the, the, the compilers and, the, and all of the instruction sets, but they have to redesign the transistor layout to work on Intel's fab. Uh, and that is a very resource, very costly process. Um, and it will require extensive investment. And then Intel has to find customers to buy these new chips. These are ARM chips that are different. So they can't just snap in to companies who are using existing ARM processors. They're not pin for pin compatible. They will need different power supplies and, and, and connectors and so forth. And so uh, Intel now basically will start manufacturing ARM CPUs on IFS technology, but now it has to find customers for it. That's a, that's a lot of work. So. Yeah. I uh, also note Intel doesn't, uh, or Intel Foundry Services doesn't say specifically where the chips will be manufactured. Uh, it does remind us that Intel is expanding its manufacturing capacity in the US and EU, which I assume is a sop to the US and European governments that are shunting taxpayer dollars to Intel. My assumption is that if these chips were being manufactured in US or EU plants, they mm -hmm. would have shouted that to the heavens in the press release. Uh, but that is just my impression. You're such a cynic. I am. Uh, <laughs> I've learned from I'll the best. I'll also point out that um, th we saw just this week, perhaps late last week, uh, Intel announced that Meteor Lake will be its first collaborative effort with TSMC on the CPU side. So TSMC is going to manufacture a Geo GPU and a system, uh, an Intel CPU using their Foveros 3D technology, thanks to Tom's hardware. Um, and they're also going to be getting a number of, uh, the GPUs are the Arc GPUs. Now, they were recently announced that that would be delayed. Obviously, the market's changing with AI and AI inference engines and NVIDIA's leads in that AI space and its ability to get customers to rapidly move on to its GPUs. Mm -hmm. And Intel, of course, is struggling to find, to hold on to its cash and to its business needs rebalancing. So um, it, it is a concern that Intel is struggling and lots of things are changing. So be aware of that. If you're times. working with Intel. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, two quick stories before we wrap. Uh, first, Broadcom's proposed VMware acquisition runs into yet another snag as the European Commission has registered its opposition to the deal. It's citing concerns that Broadcom could limit access to VMware products for Broadcom's competitors in the fiber channel, host bus adapter, and storage adapter markets. Yeah, I don't think Broadcom is going to have much fun here. I think at this stage, it's now facing up against the US, now the EU, and previously the UK regulators. Yep. Those are all three key markets for VMware to stay in business and for Broadcom itself. It's getting harder to believe that Broadcom will overcome all of these. Certainly, I don't believe it will happen in 2023. 
And I would say even if the process holds for another year and VMware can wait that long, you know, and Broadcom can wait that long because every day that Broadcom's got them under this takeover offer, VMware has to run it, run as is. They can't do anything new. They can't yep. buy anybody or make any significant changes to the business. Now, at some point, there'll be a, an expiry clause and no doubt Broadcom will be pushing hard. But I kind of expect that this isn't going to go ahead. I think Broadcom made a mistake when it told shareholders how fantastic this deal will be when they screw customers with a 300% pay rise, uh, you know, price rise. <laughs> and the competitor bodies went, oh, hello. <laughs> that so was we'll a bit see. of a slip, a little slip I think there. that might have been right thing to say to a shareholder, wrong thing to say in public. So. <laughs> yes. Uh, although I will say these uh, complaints from the UK and the EU are very specific. It's possible they could extract, you know, sort of written concessions uh, from Broadcom to promise to play nicely. I don't know if that would help. Uh, Broadcom, for its part, says essentially nothing to worry about here. We're going to get the deal done in fiscal year 2023. And that's according to Reuters. What do you expect him to say? Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> all too hard. We give ah, forget in. it. Fair, we, yeah, we quit. Forget it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've got a. There's probably like a half a billion dollar break order, or <laughs> do you know what I'm, I mean? I'm sure yeah. there's some incentive to keep them yeah. pushing this. Yes. Mm. All right, wrapping up, uh, there are reports that Microsoft will change the print screen button in Windows 11 to open a snipping tool instead of just printing the screen. Yeah, the print screen button on Windows has been something that uh, been around for, I don't know, 20, 30 years, something like that. And Microsoft announced that the print screen button won't just take a snapshot of the screen and then paste it into the copy buffer uh, in memory. It will actually now open the clipping tool, take the snapshot and then open Microsoft's clipping tool. And people have been losing their collective minds about it. I'm like quite bemused about the whole thing because I haven't seen a print screen button in, I don't know, 20 years? Three? When was the last time you used a full-size keyboard with a print screen button? Uh, I've been on Mac uh, since I joined Packet Pushers, which was back in 2015. I looked at my keyboard very closely. I didn't see a print screen. So yeah, and, and even when I was on Windows, I don't think I ever did use print screen. So this is is, is not an issue for me yeah. to... Uh, I wonder <laughs> how many people even know print screen does a screen capture. And then right. they place it, you know, it's like, it's just uh, deeply amusing. I just find it deeply amusing that this got like every press... Re uh, Either every media site released something on this, that the print screen button is going to change to open the clipping tool. And the comments, people are losing their collective minds. And I'm like, I'm, like most people don't have a print screen button. And like most people have laptops now. And most people don't use full-size keyboards even. They use small keyboards with computers. Do they even have print screen buttons? I don't know. I don't know. This seems ridiculous to me, Dre. Yes, although uh, apparently Microsoft may have anticipated this because they do allow an option in the configuration settings to switch back to the print screen's original function if if you are a classic uh, Windows <laughs> user. <laughs> there you go. All right, that wraps up the news. Uh, this is it. Uh, we don't have a tech bite, so uh, we're done for the show. Greg, if folks want to find you online, where should they go? Uh, I'm still using the Twitters as that ethereal mind. I strongly recommend that you use lists. Don't uh, don't let the algorithm tell you what to read. Uh, so if you create a list and put me in it, um, that is probably the best way to actually read what I'm tweeting out. Um, and hopefully I'll see you there. Don't mind the odd dialogue there. I'm not always online, but if you want to send me a message or send us a link, you can also head over to packetpushes.net slash FU. Give us your feedback or tell us something that we should be talking about on next week's show. Yeah. I'm Drew Conner Murray. I'm on Twitter at Drew underscore CM. I'm also blogging at Packet Pushers as then. And I'm on Mastodon on the Mastodon.social instance if you want to jump on there and see what's going on. Uh, thank you for joining us for another episode of Network Break. There's even more podcasts, blogs, and analysis over at PacketPushers.net. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, hear us on Spotify, or see us on YouTube. As always, thanks for listening.